All right, we're going to go ahead and get started. Good to see everybody, even on a, a rainy Wednesday. So thank you for being here. Uh, I'm going to start uh, by reading uh, Hebrews chapter 10, verses 1 through 11, or 1 through 10. And then we'll pray, and we will uh, start after that. So Hebrews chapter 10. Verses 1 through 10. For the law, since it has only a shadow of the good things to come, and not the very form of the things, can never, by the same sacrifices which they offer continually, year by year, make perfect those who draw near. Otherwise, they would not have ceased, they would Otherwise, they, would they not have ceased to be offered because the worshipers, having once been cleansed, would no longer have consciousness of sins? But in those sacrifices, there is a reminder of sins year by year. For it is impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sins. Therefore, when he comes into the world, he says, Sacrifice and offering you have not desired, but a body you have prepared for me. In burnt offerings and sacrifices for sin, you have taken no pleasure. Then I said, Behold, I have come. In the scroll of the book it is written of me to do your will, O God. After saying above, Sacrifices and offerings and burnt offerings and sacrifices for sins you have not desired, nor have you taken pleasure in them, which are offered according to the law. Then he said, Behold, I have come to do your will. He takes away the first in order to establish the second. By this will we have been sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. Let's pray. Lord, help us now still our minds and uh, incline our hearts to you in your word. Uh, help us now as we uh, come to study the work of your son, uh, namely the atonement and the redemption that he has uh, purchased for us. And so help us, help me to be able to teach clearly and um, faithfully to your word uh, and help us all uh, in our hearts to, to hear it, uh, to uh, understand it, to love it, and to want to live it out, and to have the ability to do so by your Spirit. Uh, so help us now in these things, we pray. Uh, in your name, amen. Okay, so you have a new verse this week. Uh, it's a short and sweet one, 1 Peter 2.24. Um, it has to deal with multiple gospel things. So it's a great verse to have memorized, just to have that truth in your heart, but also to be able to use it in conversation uh, and evangelism, um, but just in reminding yourself about the gospel and what the gospel uh, truth and what Christ has done in working and changing you. So we're going to begin tonight uh, by talking through uh, the work of Christ, and this is a large topic, and we could spend many weeks going through the work of Christ and the different um, offices that Christ has as, as a prophet, as a priest, as a king. Um, but tonight, we're just going to focus on the atoning work of Christ uh, and the work of redemption. And so our, our big idea, our main idea, is this. Christ's work in his perfect life and in his sacrificial death atoned for our sins and put us into a right and loving relationship with God. And so we're, the way we're going to, to break this down is really kind of a systematic, so a structured way of going through the Bible and putting together verses that talk about the atonement to get a holistic understanding of this doctrine throughout Scripture. Um, someone tell me, though, why, why would the atonement be a uh, very important uh, topic to discuss in Christology or in soteriology, the doctrine of salvation. Why is the atonement so significant? Or is it significant? Without the shedding of blood, there's no forgiveness of sins. Mm. 
Okay, so we're gonna we're gonna read that verse a couple times tonight. So what is that? Uh, what's the implication there behind that that verse, Jack? Well, we're sinners. Mm-hmm. Because of that, we're separated from God and under His wrath. Yeah. If somebody has to make peace for us, and we can't do it. But the Prince of Peace did it in His life and in His death in His resurrection. Right. And so, kind of by those fundamental truths that you were even mentioning there, uh, the atonement is something that every person, right, every person going, should have to interact with and think through, right? Whether to see it as a wonderful thing or to reject it. Um, but this is the truth that, that God has put before us in the cross. And so, if you are curious about any good sermons on the cross and the, the centrality of the cross, just last Sunday, Rick happened to preach on that, uh, which is very good timing for our lesson tonight. Uh, But our first point, the first thing that we're going to see in looking at uh, the atonement uh, is that first heading there, the foundations of the atonement, the love of God. Foundations of the atonement, the love of God. And you have to pick a starting place to talk about it. And so there's really kind of two, two starting places. You can either talk about God's justice and, and, and wrath or his love. And both these things intersect into uh, our understanding of the atonement. And so we're going to start with God's love. Um, but as we do that, uh, your next heading there is the focus of the atonement is to reveal God in all of his glory. Um, the problem that many have encountered when thinking about the atonement and writing about the atonement and theorizing about the atonement, whether they're Christians or not Christians, is that there can be a tendency to stray from a God-centric understanding of the work of Christ into a man-centric understanding of the atonement. And so as we embark even tonight, we need to really be focusing and, and careful to orient our thinking and interact with this doctrine in a way that... Um, is coming from God and is keeping God at the center. Uh, If we put ourselves at the center or our perspectives of what is just or loving or any of those types of things, then the atonement gets very skewed very quickly. Uh, This has been true throughout the 2,000 years of church history that we have. Um, And so really any any atonement theology that that gets that off target, that disengages from Scripture, that puts an uh, emphasis on, well, this is what would be right, or this is what I feel like, uh, quickly is, is removed from the gospel. And so we see as God acts in atonement, so in, really through Jesus and his work, uh, God has a very specific purpose. And so we can see that the cross does cover our sins. Uh, death is defeated. Uh, the works of Satan are destroyed. We are cleansed. We are restored. Yet in doing all those things, Uh, preeminently the atonement, which is the work of redemption that Jesus accomplishes, displays and proclaims the glory of God. And so his holiness, his justice, his love, his mercy, his grace, and power, all of that is displayed in, in its fullest at the cross. And so that's where we need to start. And really, if we're going to then go out and discuss the atonement with somebody else. This is something that we need to pull back to and point to, is that this is about God and his glory. And he gets glory through these things. Um, And this is really the way that God has chosen to best highlight his glory. And so we have a question then as we start this study. Why would God atone for sin? Why would God do this? If, If this is revealing God's glory, why would... God need to do this or want to do this? And so those are questions that are very dicey and that have been um, wrongly answered because we, we, aren't, we aren't to put God in an obligation box to say that God has to do something. Um, and yet we do have an understanding of God that would say that God can't just forgive sin without a payment. So kind of what uh, Jack was talking about. Um, If God is going to save sinners, to redeem people from their sin problem, he has to do it in a way that is faithful to himself. 
And so, as we see God and his love at the center of the atonement, uh, we also see that God uh, needs to atone for sin in a way that's consistent with his love and consistent with his attributes. And so, um, we have a few verses here that kind of get at this idea. Um, Can I have somebody read for me John 3.16? Or just say it. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son. All right, so the source, the reason why God is giving his son is because he loves. He loves the world. Um, And if we have time, we'll get into what the world means uh, here in John and in the rest of Scripture as well. Uh, But the, the primary cause or source of God sending his son is love. It's love. And the Bible speaks about this here in John. It speaks about it all over the place. It speaks about it in Romans 5. Uh, But God shows his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Uh, If you go further on into Romans, in Romans 8, when it's talking about this, this really this proclamation of God and his love uh, for his people, uh, we see that at the center is is God's love for us. And that's what's holding us fast, uh, even in giving us this assurance. And so uh, we see there, so then, sorry, I need to make sure I'm following your handout here. Um, The atonement is the assurance of God's great love for his people. And so those two blanks right there on that that page. The Bible speaks of the atonement as an expression of God's love, and the atonement is the assurance of God's great love for his people. So actually turn with me there to Romans chapter 8, uh, verses 32 through 39. Too big to put on a slide. Sorry, Kyle, what was that? The Bible speaks of the atonement as a... As an expression of God's love. So in Romans 8, can I have somebody read verses 32 through 39 for us? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also with him graciously give us all things? Who shall bring any charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies. Who is to condemn? Christ Jesus is the one who died. More than that, who was raised. Who is at the right hand of God, who indeed is interceding for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? As it is written, for your sake we are being killed all the day long. We are regarded as sheep to be slaughtered. No, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am sure that neither life nor death, nor angels nor rulers, nor things present nor things to come, not powers nor height nor depth nor anything else in all creation, will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. So these verses here really anchor in on the idea and the understanding of God's love as what's holding us fast. It's our assurance uh, in what he's done and what he will do for us. Uh, And this is kind of the, the anchor point then for understanding the atonement, mainly God redeeming sinners, God saving sinners from their sin. Why would he do this? Well, if we go to Romans 8 right here, we see that this is, from, this is because of his love for us. Uh, and that Christ died for us to show us his love, to make us inseparable from his love, um, so that we can then have this relationship and have this confidence and have this Christian life and calling, as, as Paul is calling the, the, the Roman Christians to, even through the end of the letter. Like this, is, this is the anchor of, of the Christian life. And so if we're going to understand the idea of atonement, we have to start with the love of God. This is the driving reason uh, for his sacrifice, for the Son doing these things. Uh, but I have a question uh, about this. Uh, why is this something, this, this love of God, this 
atoning sacrifice, and we're going to talk about the atonement aspect of it uh, more in the next point. But why is this something that is so misconstrued in the world today? We're talking about God's love, right, as a, as a thing, and we talk about the atonement, the, the sacrifice of Christ to redeem sinners. How come the world separates those things so strongly? Why is that um, hard for the world to hear? They don't want to admit that they have some part in his own salvation. Okay. Yeah, right. It's just inconceivable that I would, could, would never do something. Okay. In the human mind. Mm hmm. Don't want to be confronted with sin. Okay. The atonement confronts us with our sin. Right. Right. You just say God is love, that does not confront us with our sin. Right, and so the, how does the, the God is love, right? Because God is love in one sense, like that is one of his perfections. How does that um, confront the, the cultural understanding of God's love? Well, the, 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 culture, the culture doesn't want to acknowledge that God is also holy. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. In addition to love, he's also holy. Yeah. Yeah, and, I, and we're going to talk about that in our, in our next point. And also, they don't believe that they got just love. They don't know that the other, other attribute of his judge, he's just and righteous. Mm -hmm. They want to believe that he saves everyone, that everyone, the universal of them kind of thing. Mm -hmm. you know, it's, a lot, it's a lot easier to live your life when you don't have to worry about where you're going to go. It's like, whatever I do, God's going to love me. I don't care. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, and Chris. Yeah, I think that's a key, a key aspect. Uh, and, and I think for us as Christians, we need to see God's love so inseparably tied to the cross that you can't understand God and his love apart from the cross because that's how God is shown and chosen to demonstrate his love. Uh, and so this is the, the challenge then. I was just listening to a, a, a podcast of some uh, people who claim to be former Christians, so they've deconstructed their faith. Uh, and one of the, the, the things that they say um, is that the God of the Old Testament is so different than the God of the New Testament. The, the loving God of the New Testament is not the same wrathful God of the Old Testament. Um, and yet, the... the the, demonstration, the true demonstration of God's wrath towards sin takes place in the New Testament, on the cross. And so it's this disconnect of love and God's purpose in the cross that is so fundamental to an unbeliever's view of God, and yet so important for us to communicate as we share the gospel, as we even communicate to ourselves about the cross and about God's love. Um, to, to make sure those things aren't, con aren't disconnected. I guess they just chop Exodus 34 out of the Bible where it says, The Lord, the Lord, a God merciful and gracious, mm -hmm. and anger and abounding in steadfast love. And yeah. Faithful. Yes. Yeah, steadfast Yes. Love. No, ironically... Right yeah. No, I, ironically, the, the guy that was uh, talking on the podcast, um, his, his example was... Moses coming down from the mountain, they had been sacrificing at the golden calf, and God's like, I'm going to destroy them all. <laughs> but, I mean, like, the chapters all around that, are, are, we get to see God's love for his people and his mercy, um, and even providing <laughs> atonement, uh, even then. He didn't destroy them all. Yeah, that he didn't destroy them all, exactly. Um, so, as we are talking about this justice, this aspect of... Um, or an attribute of God is one of his perfections. Uh, we see also that if we're going to understand the atonement rightly, if we're going to understand God and his plan for Jesus dying on the cross for sinners, um, we have to see that God's justice is also there. That his, his love and his holiness and his justice all intersect at the cross. And so the necessity of the atonement uh, is God's justice. Uh, somebody read for us this uh, verse, Isaiah 6, 3. And one called to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. 
the whole earth is full of his glory. Thank you. All right, so the atonement was necessary because God is holy. If God's going to bring sinners back into a, a restored relationship with himself, then somehow the divide of God's holiness that is so far removed from the state of a sinner has to be uh, dealt with. Um, and it has to be dealt with in a way that can't just be wiping off a, a slate and saying, ah, it's just forget about it. it it's not uh, any big deal. So some sin, don't worry. Uh, this is the, kind of one of the, the common conversations that I feel like I get into with um, at least some people at VCU when I was especially a student there, is that, well, why can't God just forgive? Like, why, what's the big deal? If God's so awesome, if he's so loving, so forgiving, like, why can't he just forgive me? Uh, and the answer is like, well, he can. <laughs> he can just forgive you. Uh, but that doesn't mean the penalty for you and your sin uh, is, is any less against the holy God. That penalty still has to be dealt with. Um, and it's because he's so holy. Uh, what, give, somebody give me a definition of, of holiness. Set apart. Everybody said it all at the same time, so I didn't know what it was. Set apart. Yeah, set apart. Um, yeah, a, a pure uh, undefiledness, a, a, a separation from sin, an otherness. Uh, another way um, some theologians have talked about it is uh, in terms of devotion. Like God is entirely devoted to himself in, in the right way. And we are not. <laughs> we are not devoted to God in the right way at all. We are devoted to ourselves. And so it's this, this holiness um, is a major aspect of the atonement. Uh, in that God has to still be holy through the redemption of sinners. And so how is that going to happen? Well, we have a separate problem as well. Not only is God holy, but as we talked about last week, we aren't. We're not holy. So man is a sinner. And so we're not devoted to God. We're devoted to ourselves. Romans 3.23, all have sinned. We all fall short of the glory of God. There's no one that's outside of this category. Somebody read uh, Isaiah 59.2 for us. But your iniquities have made a separation between you and your God, and your sins have hidden his face from you so that he does not hear. Okay, so this is the problem. This is really the problem, that we are separated from God. Because of his holiness, because of our sin, we are separated from God, and we do not get to have a, a relationship with him. We don't get to be in his presence um, and we know beyond just this life what the implication of being apart from God for eternity is. What's the, what's the ultimate destination for those who are alienated from God in his presence? Hell. And, and hell isn't a... Uh, we're, I don't know if we're going to really talk about it in this class, but we, the doctrine of hell is not like hell is like some party for all the people that just want to have fun. Like, that's not what it is. It, it's eternal torment. And it's eternal torment because you have deliberately rebelled against your maker. Um, and so, because of this, because of the sin, the separation, uh, there is there's no way for us to reconcile it, to, to be back in that relationship um, with God. So, so the necessity of the atonement, then, is, is based off of this aspect of who God is and who we are. We need some sort of redeemer, some sort of mediator to fix this problem. Um, separately, or I guess next on your sheet there, um, the perfections of God require atonement. The perfections of God require atonement. This is where we're talking about the idea of, well, why can't God just forgive? Why can't he just kind of ignore, kind of, uh, somebody didn't even know what they're doing, what's the big deal? Um, can God change? Can God change? What's the, his unchangingness called? We actually talked about it in, in one of those. Yeah. He can't change. He can't uh, just decide, I'm not going to be who I am anymore. I'm going to depart from my essence. I'm going to, to fracture part of myself off. Uh, he, he's unchanging. 
Uh, he's just, uh, which is, I think, the big one that we, we know um, in terms of this idea of atonement. He's just. He, he actually will truly punish evil. He will punish wickedness. Sin has a consequence. He's holy. Uh, he's separated from sin. And as we kind of go through his attributes, we actually see that all together, right? And we're not saying that God is a, is a God made up of a whole bunch of parts because uh, he is simple. He is one essence. Um, but as we see all the attributes and as we try to take those into our mind, the cross actually becomes a very logical and necessary uh, work for Christ. Uh, another aspect of this is that the law, as we talked about last week, is not impersonal. It's not some separate thing from God that stands off in the corner. The law is God. And so to sin against God, to, to break the law, is to, is to be in opposition to God himself. Is the law God or does it reveal God's character? Well, it depends on who you ask. But for the most I'm part, it reveals God's character. <laughs> But I think you can say that the, that the law, as, as it reflects that, that character, is it, to, to break the law is to, is, to, is to oppose God directly. It's not to oppose something that's apart from God. When we sin, we sin think, first against God. Right, right. And, and to say you're breaking the law and sinning against God is to say the same thing, um, in, in Scripture, at least. I'll have sinned and fall short. Yeah, really yeah. But it so. doesn't mean that the law is God. No. No, it does not mean the law is God. I guess, yes, that's a very good clarification. Okay. Yes. Um, but the law is personal in the sense that it's not separated from God. But to break the law is a direct offense to God. Mm -hmm. Yes. Uh, we also see that God, in his grace, this is talking about his providence and his common grace that he reveals to all men, does not immediately punish law-breaking. He withholds judgment, uh, but not forever. So he, he's tarrying judgment for a reason, uh, namely to, to gather in all of his elect and to bring in his um, sheep, as we'll see uh, later. But in doing this, right, that's not to say that God is inconsistent, that he isn't punishing sin, that he isn't... Um, that he isn't, uh, what's the word? I guess inconsistent is the best word. There's, there's another word that's also really good. That I, is sure. It is, even if it's not immediate. Even though we deserve immediate. So that's where the grace comes in. Although there are some that did get immediate punishment. Mm -hmm. Right, and so this is why we can't say, well, that's not fair, that's not just. Um, it's actually not just for us not to get the immediate punishment. Um, and so we see then that justice demands judgment and it demands a penalty of sin. So it demands eternal separation from God. It demands an eternal punishment. And so this brings us to, to a problem then. So how, how can we who can't have a relationship with God, whose iniquities have, have caused us to be separated from God, we aren't like him in any way, how in the world can we have a relationship with God? Um, and so we see, that's your next heading there, without atonement, our relationship with God cannot be restored. There's no way to have a relationship with God apart from somebody dealing with your sin. And so, this is the verse that we heard earlier. Indeed, under the law, almost everything is purified with blood. And without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sins. And so this is just a truth that, that comes out of the Old Testament law code and the Levitical priesthood. And yet, the author of Hebrews really takes this and makes a humongous point. That you cannot be reconciled to God without some blood being shed. And as we read at the beginning of Hebrews 10... There is no blood of an animal, or even really of a person, of a sinful person, that can restore you and actually cleanse you. And so, as we're going through the Old Testament then, and the shadows in the Old Testament, 
is your next blank there. We see that there is a, a pattern that God has been establishing to point towards an atoning sacrifice. Another way to say this is that Scripture is consistent in talking about the atonement and the redemption of Christ. And it, it's been consistent from the very beginning. It's not a new idea that all of a sudden pops up in the New Testament. And so four aspects of atonement in the sacrifices of the Old Testament. Um, first, uh, they had to be offered up voluntarily. You couldn't force someone. Yeah, Dan? In the blank, is that... Shadows, shadows in the Old Testament, yeah, it is, yes. But sacrifices would also work. So, uh, had to be offered voluntarily, and so we see a, a reference for this is Malachi 1, 13 through 14. Um, it had to be a willing and a joyful sacrifice from a true spirit. Um, we also see that sacrifices in the Old Testament had to be offered on behalf of the guilty party. So Leviticus, let's see, I don't know if I have a verse for that. Nope, don't have a verse for that, so sorry. Leviticus 1, 3 through 4. Leviticus 16, uh, it talks about the Day of Atonement. That these are sacrifices that are offered on behalf of others who are, are guilty before God. Uh, another aspect of sacrifices in the Old Testament, they had to be without defect. So Leviticus 22, uh, 21 talks about this. They had to be without blemish. They had to be perfect in the sense of uh, what you could offer it with a lamb. Uh, and then very importantly, they had to involve the loss of blood or the life of the victim in exchange for the worshiper. And so all of this, in that sense, is pointing to that sin equals death. And that somebody has to die for sin. I have a question. Yeah. Can we pay for our own sin with our own death? With our own blood? Why, hmm. why is that not sufficient? Hmm. That's the third point. Yes. Yes. Yeah, it's, it's mostly because... I mean, I think there's multiple reasons, but I would say mostly because you aren't pure or perfect. You can't atone for something. You're already in the negative in that sense. You're, a negative can't make a positive. So we're dirty, we can't be clean. Yeah. Yep. What was the last one that you said? It involves the loss of blood and life of the victim for the worshiper. Substitute. Exactly. <coughs> Yeah, and so it, that all those things together, right? You you can't offer a blunt, a perfect sacrifice on behalf of you to cleanse you if it's you. <laughs> That's kind of the problem. And this is the problem that comes out of the Old Testament. That they're like, what do we do? How are we going to be able to be cleansed? We have to continually offer these sacrifices, um, and so. That's really what the Day of Atonement, really the centerpiece of the book of Leviticus, and really the centerpiece of the Levitical priesthood and the sacrificial system, points to, is that this is every year. Like, this is a continual thing. Uh, it's perpetually going, but it's pointing forward to some end point, that it won't always be like this. And so, Hebrews 10, 1 through 4, For since the law has but a shadow of the good things to come, instead of the true form of these realities, it can never, by the same sacrifices that are continually offered, year or offered every year, make perfect those who draw near. And so this is the problem, is that we need to be made perfect somehow to be able to draw near to God, be able to have this relationship with God, uh, and we can't. And so this is... One of the points of the book of Hebrews is that only through Jesus can this happen. Uh, but I want to point to, to one thing here. Um, as we go to that last line, Christ had to suffer to satisfy God's justice. Um, that the God of the Old Testament is the same God of the New Testament. And we know this even in how he sets up these patterns. He sets up these shadows, so to speak, to point to Christ as the only atonement, the only atonement that can actually satisfy him. And so then, as we get to that, that last thing there, Christ had to, satis had to suffer to satisfy God's justice, it all boils down to that 
for God to get justice and to truly be able to punish sin and truly be able to redeem people, he had to, in one sense, die for himself. He had to be the sacrifice. He had to go in the place of the sinners because there's nothing else. There's nothing else in creation that can actually truly satisfy God's requirements. And so to really demonstrate his love and his justice, he had to be the one to die. And so, as we consider that and think about that, why do so many uh, Christians, too, but even unbelievers, look at God's justice and consider it unjust? Look at the, look at the cross, look at the sacrifice of the Son, and say that that's not justice. What's, what's going on in their minds? What are they thinking? They think he's mean. Mm-hmm. Kill Jesus. Cosmic child abuse. Yeah. Yeah. We're accustomed to paying for our own sins, but we can't in front of God. And we're mm-hmm. doing, if we err or do something wrong, then we know we need to, you know, here, just earthly standards, we know we need to make up for it somehow. Mm-hmm. But we can't make up for that. Mm-hmm. You know, we can't pay for our own sins. Yeah. Own Christ. Mm-hmm. And, and part of the problem is that we can't even really comprehend our own sin uh, rightly before God. Well, that's the problem right there, right? Mm-hmm. Like, humanity can't. Mm-hmm. You said it before, and I don't know if it was in class here or, in, or in, in the sermon, but we see sin the way we want to see it mm-hmm. and not the way God sees it. Mm-hmm. So we tend to see justice the way we want to see it. So we, we bring God down mm-hmm. right in. So we think that, well... I would never do that. Mm-hmm. How can a loving God, right? Mm-hmm. Um, but it, it's not that he's, you said it before, it's not that he's loving, because he is. He's, he's all those characteristics, but because of, and forgive my trans, you know, um, pronunciation, but the, the Greek, right, the holy, 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 the tri- mm-hmm. triagon, mm-hmm. right, he's holy, 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 right, and because he's holy, 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 he loves, and in loving, he must also hate. Mm-hmm. How, how can a loving God yeah. hate too? Yeah. So we, we bring them down to, or we try to bring them down to our our level. Right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, no, that's exactly... Like we're that's made in his image, yeah. then he must yeah. be like me, right? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, Sam, you're going to say something? Yeah. Um, I think the secular world often repeats this, that... This, Jesus said this, greater love has no one than this, that someone lay down his life for his friends. Mm-hmm. That's the offered up voluntarily. It's the first two parts of the requirements right there and statement. And people say that and they consider people heroes and loving other people, but they don't see that that's the love of Christ. Mm-hmm. To do that. Mm-hmm. Yeah, sir. Scripture says, Luke says in Acts 4, verse 12, Salvation is found in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given by men by which we must be saved. Mm-hmm. That's one of our... Sorry, the ice came out of my cup unexpectedly. <laughs> We're going to look at that verse later as well. Um, but yeah, there, there's a... That about sums it up. Yeah, there's an unpopular an unpopularness to having only one option, right? To say that you can't do it yourself, that you can't get to define it the way you want to, that, that somebody else has already done those things and done them in a way that is entirely non-negotiable. You don't get to go there and, and say, well, what about this other thing? Can I get a side deal, any of that? You don't get to do that uh, in God's justice system. Um, but it's because... God gets the glory through all of the means that he has put before you for salvation. And so this is kind of why it's important to go back to that first starting point, that foundational point, that God is glorified through the atonement. And every step of the way, whether it's you acknowledging your sin, you seeing him as just, you understanding his holiness, you seeing your need for a savior, Jesus coming and dying and living that perfect life, all those things, all those little parts of that all come together to bring Glory to God. And so, as what the, the world wants to talk about, the atonement or the cross or who Jesus is, right? every single one of those things, they're trying to 
to take away from God's glory. And God is not pleased by that. Um, but we'll see more of this as we um, move. Oh, that's why I didn't have all of that there. Um, in the work of Christ, uh, atonement in the New Testament, the centrality of the cross. And so as we um, approach the New Testament, as we approach um, theology, sometimes we can be very theoretical, very philosophical, very abstract uh, with our ideas of what, what God is and what he wants and who people are and what they like and all this type of kind of mumbo-jumbo language that doesn't actually go, come to the point of saying that there is a real person named Jesus Christ who lived a real life 2,000 years ago, and he really died on a real Roman cross. That really happened. And so our uh, first heading there is historic objectivity. For the atonement to actually matter, for the atonement to actually accomplish anything, it actually had to happen. It actually had to happen. It can't just be a theoretical concept. And so we see that Jesus died on the cross in a particular point in time and space. And so um, Apostle Paul talks about this in Galatians 4. Uh, but when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those who were under the law so that we might receive adoption as sons. Right? It was in God's timing. It was in God's plan uh, for this to happen. Uh, 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 11. It, it, Paul is basically almost giving a history lesson of who Jesus was, what happened when he died, what happened after he died. He's giving you all the historical facts. Uh, as they go around in Acts and they're planting churches and they're going to synagogues and they're talking to people about Jesus, they talk about a real person who really lived and died. Um, and so for us to, to kind of focus in then on uh, the atonement, we have to have that in mind, that this is a real event, that it really happened. Um, and so another implication out of that then is that the atonement has occurred and it cannot be repeated. The atonement has, recurred, has occurred and cannot be repeated. Christ cannot be re-sacrificed, and there's no continuing act of atonement. And so, to, to say so, to do so, do anything else otherwise, is to say that Christ's work on the cross was insufficient. And so, Hebrews 10, 11 through 14 uh, can I have somebody read this for us? And every priest stands daily at his service, offering repeatedly the same sacrifices, which can never take away sins. But when Christ had offered for all time a single sacrifice for sins, he sat down at the right hand of God. For by a single offering, he has perfected for all time those who are being sanctified. Okay, this is the, the one time... Right? This is the, the one-time deal that Christ has offered for all time a single sacrifice. And then he finished. Right? He sat down. He was done. Um, and that's kind of the point as we talk about the priests. Like, they're never done in, the, in that system. They were never done. When Christ did his one sacrifice, he finished it and was done. And it was over. There are no chairs in the temple. Yeah, there are no chairs. Yeah, exactly. The priest to sit down. Yeah. And so Christ, he is a throne. He is sitting down. Um, so what, what's so important about this? Well, there is a lot of Christian um, background to this idea of, well, what about if we kept doing some things that would be helpful for us? Um, and so I, I think we can rightly pick on the Catholic Church. And this is what the Reformers had major issues with, uh, was this idea of the Eucharist and what you're saying as you're, as you're proclaiming a new, in one sense, sacrifice of Christ, a re-sacrifice of Christ to then bless and give grace. Uh, or in penance. Uh, what happens in penance? Well, there's contrition for sin. Like we say, well, that's good. 
There's confession of sin, and even in the Catholic doctrine, they say it's supposed to be to God. So that's good. But then what's the next part of penance that they say? You have to do works of satisfaction. As in, you need to earn merit. You need to get uh, more grace in that sense. You need, to, you need to earn that, and you need to get it from someplace else other than Jesus. Uh, either from you or for somebody else that had a lot of extra. Um, and, and what is that saying? It's, it's denying this, that Christ offered that once and for all sacrifice, that it was sufficient. And so, uh, as we are, are thinking about these things, uh, we need to know that this was a one-time event, and this is all that n- is needed. And so, as we're talking to somebody about the gospel, as we're explaining the work of Christ, like we do need to highlight that one-time event, that it did happen, and that it was all that was needed to happen. Uh, you don't need to do uh, anything else uh, to, to save yourself. You can't, actually. Okay, so what is the atonement? What's the nature of the atonement? Well, it is a completed work. It's a completed work. The work of the atonement has been accomplished through the obedience of Christ and and really his obedience to the Father. So uh, Philippians 2.8 And being found in human form, He humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. And there's two uh, theological categories that Christians have talked about in terms of obedience. There's active obedience and there's passive obedience. And so active obedience is Christ's obedience for us. Namely that he obeyed the requirements of the law in our place. So, substitute. And was perfectly obedient to the Father's will as our representative. And so this is kind of that idea of of imputation from last week, that you get credit for somebody else's work, that something else gets applied to you. Uh, Romans 5.19, For as by the one man's disobedience the many were made sinners, so by the one man's obedience the many will be made righteous. And so his obedience, his active obedience, living it out, being obedient, following the, the commands of his Father, uh, is, is very important uh, in this uh, work of the atonement. And his life, his human life, living from infant to, to a 33-year-old man, uh, is important. Uh, why couldn't he have just been... Uh, drop down as a man to be the sacrifice, jump on the cross real quick, and, and, and die? Why couldn't that have happened? What was needed? All those good works that he did during his life and all the <coughs> mm-hmm. proved who he was. And so that was, he was accruing, I guess you'd say in a certain sense, accruing righteousness mm-hmm. and showing righteousness. Mm-hmm. Yeah, re- doing good things. Yeah, revealing his righteousness, revealing, right, that obedience lived out, right, and as in this way, or as in, like, as in he lived out, he, he was obedient, he bore it out in his life, uh, yes, and also kind of to reveal who he is, right? I mean, it, that's why they have this evidence, these testimonies, these gospels of Jesus' life, yeah. Well, one of the other things, he, he got a following because of the miracles he had done before the cross. Mm-hmm. So, in order to be a peer of the 500, you had to have a following. Mm-hmm. So, that's the reason you drop them on the earth down. The yeah, well, yeah, it was God's plan, right? For teaching, a lot of Jesus' teachings were offensive to most of the people. Mm-hmm. The reason the people were following was because of his miracles. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, Jack. But the real reason he lived all those things out, uh, even more so if we want to apply it to ourselves, because those good works get credited to us for mm-hmm. righteousness. Mm-hmm. We don't have any real righteousness, but his active righteousness, his real righteousness that he accrued during his life is credited or imputed to us, which in God's mind allows us to have righteousness. It's not ours, but it's real because he did it. Yeah, and it, and it really, in one sense, belongs to us because it's been given to us. It's not something we did. No? Right. There's a verse in Hebrews that says, therefore he had to be made like his brothers in every Yes, respect. I was wondering when so somebody was going to say this. Merciful and faithful high priest. Yeah. Right? And 
the house of God. Yeah. He would make propitiation for the sins of the people. I mean, yes. It had to be made like us. Yeah. And that was Bill's lesson a couple weeks ago. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and we also see in Hebrews that he had to, in order for him to be able to sympathize with us, to, to be that brother who can, that we can go to when we are struggling, right, and, and facing temptation. He's there because he lived that life, and he knows what it is to be tempted. He knows what it is to be sick and to hurt and all these things. And baptism, he said it was necessary for him to fulfill all righteousness. Mm-hmm. Yeah, absolutely. No sin to be perfect sacrifice. So during the lifetime, he mm-hmm. didn't have to finish. Yeah, that's, a, that's another good aspect. It's kind of to what Jack was saying, is that he had to live that life to basically get to the cross to, to prove, right? Look, this is, I am sinless, and I have a, the life to show it. Um, and the resurrection proves it. Yes, it's the receipt, right? Absolutely. All right, Philippians 3.9. Um, he's... And being found in him, not having a righteousness of my own, so this is Paul talking, that comes from the law, but that which comes through faith in Christ, the righteousness from God that depends on faith. So Paul there, he's talking about, he doesn't have his own righteousness from all these right, things that he could claim, right, that seem really great, uh, even in the eyes of a, a Jew at that time. Like, that's worthless to him. Uh, the, the righteousness that has any value, like it's the one that has surpassing value, is the one that comes from God, and it's the one that you receive from faith, by faith. It's not even something that you get to pay for. There's any sort of transaction. It's not a work that you do. It's something that you get from your union with Christ um, through the faith that he gives you as a gift. Uh, All the things that Paul claimed there that he <coughs> left as rubbish, God has established as important, mm-hmm. but there, it's not meritorious for salvation. Right. It can't atone for sin. Can't right, be. exactly. Right, and the, like in the sacrifices, right, that that God commanded His people to do, right. It was good that they did them. Like it wasn't wrong for them to do them. Like, it was good that they were obedient in following those things. And yet, as soon as they would put any hope for any righteousness of their own from those sacrifices and doing that work, that's when. Uh, it goes on its head. Um, let's see, do I have this one? This is a verse that we're going to see in the sermon this Sunday. So, we'll see if I say it the right way. <laughs> uh, and because of him, you are in Christ Jesus, who became to us wisdom from God, righteousness, and sanctification, and redemption. And so, we get <laughs> righteousness. We get It comes from Jesus, uh, but it comes from God through Jesus to us. Um, because of what Christ did in his obedience in his life. So that's his active obedience. Uh, The second way we we can talk about the obedience of Christ and and being in the complete work of the atonement uh, is in his passive obedience. And that he suffered for us. He took the penalty for our sins and died for those sins. Now when he died, he didn't just die a death and then somebody like got a staple and just packed on some sins on onto his body like no when he died he was actually dying in the moment for our sins uh, for the sins of the elect um, and so although he was a son he learned obedience through what he suffered uh, especially on the cross. And being made perfect, he became the source of eternal salvation to all who obey him. That is through this, this penalty paying, like through this life lived and life given, Christ's obedience fully completes God's requirements for holiness and righteousness for us. And so this is the, the completed work of the atonement. But now we're going to get to really what makes Christian atonement, the evangelical gospel understanding of atonement uh, for us, and what's really important for us, uh, is this. Penal substitutionary atonement. Penal substitutionary atonement. What's the first one? Penal. Yes. Exactly. Ooh, that's not a good marker. Penal. As in, yes, as in that's the penalty. Uh, 
And this is called substitutionary atonement as well. Uh, but the, kind of this is the formal title of it is penal substitutionary atonement. And there are other theories that are wrong <laughs> about the atonement. Uh, we're not going to cover them tonight. We're just going to cover what's true. Yeah. Um, so as we survey Scripture, as we seek to understand and compile uh, all these texts about the atonement in the Bible and put them into a system of theology, in our systematic theology, that's what we're doing, uh, this is the doctrine of the atonement that Scripture reveals. And this is what the, the true gospel-believing church has always believed as well. I think that's important for us to, to say. Uh, so this is kind of what makes us evangelicals and makes us gospel-believing Christians. And this is what it is, that Jesus has taken on the sins of his people and substituted himself in their place, taking on the judgment and wrath of God uh, in their stead. And so Jesus has taken the penalty, right, penal, that idea, uh, of our sins by substituting himself in our place in order to, to redeem, to make atonement uh, for us. And so a, a few helpful verses for this idea. He, he takes the penalty. Uh, Isaiah 53, if you, uh, the whole chapter, <laughs> really. Um, but we, we'll go through verses 4 through 6. Uh, he has borne our griefs. So this, this is Isaiah looking forward, looking at the, the suffering servant and seeing, like, who, what is this servant? Who, who is he? Uh, and it's clear, I mean, he's a person. He's a, he's a human. Um, he's not a lamb. He's not some sort of sacrificial animal. Uh, and as he's writing this, right, Isaiah 53, 4 through 6, he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God, and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace. And with his wounds we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. Now, this is a, a powerful passage, right? And this is in the Old Testament. Testifying to what this atonement, what this... Penal substitution is, it is somebody coming in and taking on the iniquity of us all and taking the punishment, pierced for our transgressions, uh, in our place. Uh, our memory verse, 1 Peter 2.24, He himself bore our sins in his body on the tree. And we don't have time to talk about it a whole bunch tonight, but dying on a tree for a Jewish person, like this was the cursed thing. Like, I mean, the Bible says like, you're cursed if you die on a tree. And that is very true for them. So for Peter to just say this so, so bluntly is to reveal in one sense how serious this is. He himself bore our sins in his body on the tree that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. By his wounds you have been healed. So he, he takes the penalty uh, we also see that he substitutes himself. He substitutes himself. 1 Peter 3.18 For Christ also suffered once for sins, the righteous for the unrighteous. Right, so like going to like Bob's question, like when you're interacting with somebody, it's like, whoa, why can't I just do it? Like, what, what about, like, am I okay? Can I, can I get my way with God? Uh, it's like, no, you can't because you are unrighteous. You need somebody righteous to die for you, to die in your place. But if I died for my sins, I'd be dead. You will be. That's the answer. <laughs> yeah. Hello. Yeah. No, I mean, it's, it's not a very logical position that they end up in. Let's put it that way. It is. Yeah. It's, but it's a sin because you're sinning against the image of God, right? Yeah. Um, 2 Corinthians 5.21 for our sake he made him to be sin, who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of our God. Or of God. Um, he did this for our sake. Right? It wasn't because he just wanted to have fun and show off something. Right? The, the atonement had a purpose. And so this would be just saying something, well, Jesus was just a really good example. 
It's like, no, he wasn't just a good example. He was somebody who actually took on sin as well. Yeah, James. So just a question. Does the theory of penal substitutionary atonement include the imputation of righteousness, or is it strictly focused on his substitution in place for our penalty? Uh, I, I would say that it does include the substitute to the great exchange. The yes, the yes, part. yeah. Yeah, so our, we get his righteousness, he gets our sin. Um, and actually, that's what we're talking about in just two verses here. Uh, Mark 10.45, right? This is Jesus speaking about himself and his ministry and his purpose. For even the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. Right? Jesus, he knows that he's coming in to be a substitute, to take on the sins of others. Uh, Romans 5, 8. But God shows his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Um, and we'll talk about this more, kind of what James was talking about in terms of the, the great exchange, as it's called, the, the, one, the wonder that Christ would take my sin and that I get to take his righteousness. Like that, that, that's not fair. That's not fair. <laughs> and it's something that we can't, because we can't truly understand our sin and we can't truly understand his righteousness. Uh, and yet that's the, the wonder of the gospel. Um, we're going to talk about that in a few weeks, really directly, and, and uh, kind of like the personal side of salvation and soteriology. We're, here, we're looking at the atonement here. Um, but when God looks upon me or, or any of his children, right? Any of you, uh, he sees them just as they had never sinned and as if they had always obeyed. And that's not because of you. <laughs> it, it's because of Christ. Because he looks at you and he sees Christ and he sees the, the, the righteousness of Christ and he sees the obedience of Christ. And then he loves you as his son because of those things. That's the, the wonder of this gospel and this atonement. So does he love you because he saved you? He loved you. He saved you because he loved you. Yeah. Dan, yes. <laughs> well, okay. So this is a fun question. Because, I mean, did he love us before yeah. So, so this, is, this is the question. Is in eternity past, right, did God say, okay, I'm going to save sinners. That's what I'm going to do. And then decide a plan to save sinners, like through Jesus. Or was it the other way around, right? He's like, I have, I'm going to reveal myself through my son this way. And then I'm going to save these sinners through this plan. Um, and so people talk about it. I was reading about it. It's really complicated, so I wasn't going to bring it up. But thank you. <laughs> well, it was because of the way you worded something mm -hmm. that I asked the question. Mm. That's all cool. Yes, no, it's, I, I think we all agree. Yes, I hope so. God loves us <laughs> in Christ. Love yes, from the foundations of the earth. Yeah. yeah. Yes. Does that verse answer the question? We were still sinners when he showed his love for us. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Doesn't that verse answer that question? It does, but I'm not sure that was the question. So that was the, that's the, the thing. It, it, yes, it's a good answer, though. All right. So let's move on to the language of the atonement before Dan asks another question. I'm um, no, just kidding. Dan, keep asking questions. Um, how is the atonement spoken of in the New Testament? Because we don't get all of these really nice systematic theology categories and headings. So how does, how does the Bible, how do the biblical authors talk about this? Um, so really quickly, uh, we'll run through some of these. Um, I think I have, I have four for us. Uh, first, they use sacrificial and ritual language. So the atonement was a sacrifice, and it was effective in that it permanently reconciles man to God. And so... Ephesians 2.13. This is talking about the atonement. But now in Christ Jesus, you who were once far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ, right? The sacrificial blood of Christ. Uh, we have Romans 5.9, which we've seen before. You've been justified by his blood. Right? This is talking about the sacrifice. We also use redemptive language, as in the language of the prison or the marketplace that you've been redeemed and, and brought out of. Um, so buying back from enslavement, right? You're no longer a slave to sin. You are a slave to Christ. Uh, you have a new, better master, uh, an infinitely better master. And so languages, we're talking about slaves and um, ransoms being paid. So 
Um, all right, Revelation 9. Mm -hmm, exactly, yeah, same, same type of language. Uh, by your blood you ransomed people for God. You've, you've paid the payment to, to redeem them uh, for yourself from every tribe, language, and people, and nation. Um, we also have reconciliation or, or relational language. Christ's atonement was a reconciliation, uh, a reconciliatory, blah, 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 a reconciliatory work. No, it wasn't. Um, meaning, he mends and restores broken relationships between God and man. So Romans 5.10. While we were enemies, right? this is our broken relationship, we were reconciled to God by the death of, death of his son. Uh, much more now that we are reconciled, shall we be saved by his life. Right? This idea of, of hostility and then reconciliation. Uh, but perhaps the most common way that we understand this is the language of the law court. Um, the legal language of our justification. Right? We were guilty. Uh, we had a legal debt. We had a penalty uh, that demanded payment. And Jesus is the one that steps in and pays that penalty. And so like Romans 3, 24 through 26, which we're not going to read, but Romans 3 really talks about this uh, Exactly. Um, but yeah, it's that so that he would be the just judge, right? That punish sins, but also the one to declare righteous, right? The justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. And so he's stepping in into the courtroom, so to speak, to talk about that. Uh, but we don't have a lot of time, so we have to keep moving. Okay, so this is fun because this one we needed more time to talk about for the second question here. So we're going to be very clear, but probably not answer all the questions. First question, though, is Jesus' atonement the only atonement that saves? Yes. yes. Okay, um, and this is the controversy between Christians and non-Christians, right, that... that this is the thing that saves you, that you are redeemed from your sin because of Jesus and the atonement. Um, so that's where we have Acts 4.12, um, that there's salvation in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. Like This is, this is it. This is the only way that salvation is possible. Um, but it's only through the atoning work of Christ. It's not just through you like God or you read your Bible or any of these things. Um. But yeah, listen to Rick's sermon from this past Sunday. It's really good on that point. Um, and so that's what our message has to be. We're not talking about conservative values, um, good social policy, any of that. Like We preach Christ crucified, and then everything else lines up behind that. Um, let's see. Okay, so I have a question there. For whom did Christ die? Um, which is a Big question to get into with not much time. Um, well yes, played. yes. <laughs> so I will give you the really wrong answer first. Universalism. That Christ died for everybody to save everybody from their sin. And as we look at the Bible, that's just not true. Like we see... Yeah, no, <laughs> exactly. And we're going to talk about the effectiveness in a second. But God did not die and save everybody from their sins. Mainly because we see the Bible says that there's going to be people that are going to be judged for their sin for all eternity. Um, and so it's just, um, yeah, not consistent with Scripture. So universalism uh, is wrong. Um, but then there is this understanding of, well, did Christ die just to uh, make possible salvation? Or when, did, or when Christ died on the cross, did he actually save people? Was, was something actually accomplished? Was there an actual payment made, and a, and a soul redeemed in that sense. Um, and so that's the, the, the concept of particular redemption or limited atonement. And it's thorny, and Christians don't agree about it. Um, but it's um, very important, I think, to get at what the cross actually did. Did Christ actually offer an effective sacrifice? Uh, because that's where our assurance needs to be, right? That Christ did save me, and there's nothing that can take me out of his hand. There's nothing that I can do to remove myself um, from his payment, from, from his love for me, from his 
sacrifice for me. Um, and so, just a few verses for you to, to think through for that. Uh, we'll not read them all, but we'll jot them down. Hebrews 10, 14. Uh, John uh, 6, 37 through 39. John 10, 14 through 16. All right, it's talking about, like, he's going to save the ones that the Father gives him. And he's going to lay down his life for his sheep. Um, and by implication, like, th- those are his, and they will always be his. Yeah, I can. Uh, Hebrews 10, 14. John 6, 37 through 39. In John 10, 14 through 16. Um, but, yes, he did. He, he, he laid down his life uh, for the ones that, that God gave him, right? He laid down his life for his sheep. Um, and I think another way to say this is that Jesus' death is entirely effective in saving everyone he died for. As in, there's no, he didn't die for somebody that's not going to get saved. Uh, that, that doesn't happen. It wasn't like, well, you missed the boat. Oops, sorry. There was some clerical error. Like, if Jesus died for you, then you are going to be saved from your sin. Um, and he'll get you all the way home. Um, all that the Father gives me will come to me, and I'll certainly not cast them out. Yeah. That verse, and then also Titus chapter 1, verse 1 through 2 mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Like Ephesians 1. Yeah. But, but yeah. just because you're elect or chosen doesn't mean you're saved. Right, you have to you're be. you're not saved until you're saved. Yep, exactly. So, getting to a, a, one application then. How shall we live in light of the atonement? Uh, we still have, we don't know who the elect are. We don't know. God doesn't give us like little signs like, oh, you should, that one's one of mine. Go talk to him real quick. Like we don't, I mean, maybe in the Spirit's prompting that's what's happening ultimately. But we are still called to bring the gospel to all and to preach the, go- the gospel to like what Jack just said, because all who come to him, he won't cast out, right? And so we are called to bring that message um, and to, to say what is said in, in, in Romans 10, right? Call upon the name of the Lord and you will be saved. Like that's true. Um, and so we have that responsibility um, as evangelists and we don't have much time. We're going to sing a song real quick. Rick, if that's okay, we've got time. Um, but as Rick's getting up here, I uh, just consider that the end of uh, or the brr, Hebrews chapter 10. Real quick, I'm going to steal time while Rick's going. Hebrews chapter 10, uh, verses 19 through 25. Like this is the author of Hebrews reflecting on the atonement and then what it looks like in the life of a Christian. And it's drawing near to God, it's holding fast, and helping others to do the same. So that's what we need to be doing as believers.